Welcome to Cinematic Excrement, and the next chapter in my exciting quit, well, my mildly riveting quest to review every film that has won the Razzie for Worst Picture. Today we look at the year 1982, and one of the more bizarre movies I've reviewed on this show. Inchon, alternately known as Inchon, because it is sometimes spelled with an exclamation point in the title. Kind of like, Mother! or Airplane, or Why Did You Let Pierce Brosnan Sing? Incheon is at least partially about the early days of the Korean War, and specifically the Battle of Incheon, where the United Nations forces, led by American General Douglas MacArthur, fought off the communist invaders and ultimately saved South Korea's bacon. The film does have a bit of a religious slant, unsurprising as it was sponsored by Sun Myung Moon's Unification Church, a fairly young and often controversial sect of Christianity. Which is wonderful, because faith-based movies always turn out so well. Remember Left Behind? Or Miracles from Heaven? Or that crappy 2012 knockoff from the Asylum? What treasures those were! Anyway, Sun Byung Moon led an interesting life to say the least. He was born in what is now known as North Korea and imprisoned by the communist regime during the Korean War. So as you might expect, he's not terribly fond of communism. He escaped to South Korea in 1950 where he founded the Unification Movement, which, considering the church's controversial nature, is false advertising if I ever heard it, and later moved to the United States in 1971. The church does have some odd practices, like their blessing ceremonies or mass weddings. They once held a ceremony in D.C. with 30,000 couples. But I'm not going to dwell too much on that because, really, all religions are weird, at least to some extent. I am, however, going to drag Moon as a person because he was a right bastard. He did, after all, support President Nixon during the Watergate scandal and encouraged his followers to do likewise, and he founded the Washington Times, which is basically to newspapers what Fox News is to television. And while he claimed to be the second coming of Christ, yes really, he was anything but Christ-like. He was quite the bigoted asshole and likened gay people to dirty, dung-eating dogs. He married his wife Hak Jahan when she was 17 and he was 40, which is skeevy as hell. And while he claimed to be against divorce and sex outside of marriage, he was divorced at least once and possibly several times depending on whose story you believe. And according to several witnesses, including his first wife, he had multiple affairs and even fathered a child out of wedlock. Do as I say, not as I do, eh? Well, enough about the terrible person that is Sun Myung Moon. Let's talk about the terrible movie that is Inchon. Directed by Terrence Young, who directed three of the early James Bond films and even recruited Sean Connery to play the British secret agent, Inchon was financed by Moon and Mitsuharu Ishii, a Unification Church member and newspaper publisher in Japan. They put together a decent cast, including legendary Japanese actor Toshiro Mifune, though his role in the film is basically a glorified cameo, and none other than Laurence Olivier was cast to play General MacArthur, and they got Jerry freaking Goldsmith to compose the score. So it seems they were at least trying to make a good movie. They did not succeed, but they tried. Amazingly, Moon's involvement in the film was initially kept secret even from the cast and crew. According to cast member Ben Gazzara, they didn't know Moon was involved until six weeks into production. That seems like kind of a dick move, which I suppose should be expected from a guy like Moon. The film was plagued by production problems and required extensive on-location reshoots due to Moon's recommended changes to the script and the death of actor David Jansen. The aging Olivier also struggled with the experience, and his reshoots had to be done in Rome as his poor health made him incapable of traveling back to South Korea. The film's world premiere was at a black tie gala in May of 1981, but its theatrical release was delayed until the following year. It was also screened at the White House by then-President Ronald Reagan, who referred to it as a brutal but gripping picture about the Korean War. However, he seems to be one of the few people who like the film, as most critics refer to Inchon as not only among the worst films of 1982, but of all time. This was reflected in the box office as well, as Inchon only made about $5 million against a $46 million budget, plus another $11 million in production costs, and it was pulled from theaters after its second weekend. It was the biggest financial failure of the year. So let's take a look at why the film was such a miserable failure. And I will apologize for the video quality of these clips right off the bat, but it can't be helped. 
Inchon has never been released on home video, so for video footage I have to rely on a VHS bootleg that was recorded off a cable television network that was owned at the time by, you guessed it, the Unification Church. I'm honestly not sure why it's never been released on home video. Even terrible movies usually get a home video release of some sort. Hell, if Monos can get a freaking Blu-ray release, you would think Inchon would have at least found its way to DVD after all these years. Well, while Inchon is at least partly about a historical event, the movie is not a documentary. It even begins with a disclaimer to this effect, which is more than we get from most movies bearing the tag based on a true story. Where dramatic license has been deemed necessary, the authors have taken advantage of this license to dramatize the subject. Well, haven't used this one in a while. The first thing you might notice is this movie looks really cheaply made, which is odd considering it wasn't. $46 million in 1982 is the equivalent of about $120 million today. And this does not look like a $120 million movie. This has made for TV written all over it. I know I'm watching a VHS bootleg, but it should still look like a VHS bootleg of a big budget Hollywood film. This looks like a VHS bootleg of an 80s daytime soap. And the audio isn't any better. Listen to this. One more time. Now, what would you say that was? Some kind of gun, right? Sounds like a six-shooter from an old Western movie, doesn't it? Well, this is where you will hear that sound while watching Inchon. Yeah, that was a tank. I would think the equivalent of $120 million would be enough to afford a decent tank firing sound effects. Unless that's actually what they thought tanks sounded like. But no, no, they couldn't possibly have been that incompetent. Could they? The ADR doesn't sound any better for that matter. What's he saying? They're gonna explode up the bridge. Oh, yes, I totally believe that Korean child right there said that line and not someone in a studio. And once again, I'm having flashbacks to The Gifted. Seriously, if anyone from the Fox Network is watching, spend more time and money on the ADR for season two, please and thank you. And the editing is some of the worst I've ever seen. Look at this. That still frame? That wasn't anything I did. That's actually part of the movie. Did they not think anyone would notice that all movement suddenly stopped for a full second? Come on now. The movie also has this weird thing where it cuts to the next scene before somebody finishes a sentence. Somebody get the hell out of here without God help Korea and God help us all. How? How does any editor worth his salt let that happen? And they appear to have half-assed the Korean subtitles. This scene, for example, contains six lines of dialogue. Only three are subtitled. Which three? Well, I don't speak Korean, so your guess is as good as mine. This movie had four editors. Four. Two were relatively new to Hollywood. For one, Inchon was his first feature-length film, and for the other, his second. But the other two editors were Hollywood veterans. John W. Holmes, who was nominated for an Oscar for The Andromeda Strain, and Peter Taylor, who won an Oscar for The Bridge on the River Kwai. How did two Oscar-caliber editors give us this? Well, keep in mind, two Oscar-caliber editors also gave us The Snowman. I don't care how good you are, you can't turn chicken shit into chicken salad. Anyway, as this movie is loosely based on the story of the Battle of Incheon, a good chunk of the film focuses on the events leading up to that battle. North Korean troops cross the 38th parallel and capture a significant amount of territory, including the South Korean capital, Seoul. Off camera, the United Nations Security Council passes a resolution to send troops to aid the South Koreans, and the man chosen to act as supreme commander of the UN forces in Korea is none other than U.S. General Douglas MacArthur, played by Lawrence O. Lord, what am I looking at? Remember how Mommy Dearest did such an amazing job of turning Faye Dunaway into Joan Crawford? Well, this is the exact opposite of that. He looks like a wax statue come to life. He looks like Mark Hamill in the Star Wars Holiday Special. That face, that hair, that everything, just all of this is wrong. And his performance is not much better. 
I suspect part of that could be blamed on his failing health at the time, as he often seems a bit out of it, speaking very slowly, putting way too many long pauses between sentences. There's one really bizarre moment where he's talking about his plan to invade Inchon with other military leaders, and he lights his pipe and takes a puff before he speaks. He then proceeds to flail that pipe all over the place, even turning it upside down a couple of times. It looks like he honestly forgot that he just lit that pipe, and for some reason the director never pointed it out. Now, I don't smoke myself, so I could be talking out of my ass here, but holding a lit pipe upside down, especially when you're palming the open end, seems like a bad idea. And then there's the voice. It's... well, just listen. Don't you believe it. They'll probably send out Joe Collins or Omar Bradley. We retreated, but look how the enemy has spread out his forces. That channel into Inchon from this distance looks difficult. Believe me, my friends, God is on our side. So, remember when I said a couple episodes ago that giving a Razzie to Laurence Olivier felt like sacrilege? I may have to take that back. I understand what he was trying to do here, and trying is the key word. He was trying to sound like the real General MacArthur. But the voice he came up with does not sound like MacArthur, nor does it sound like his normal voice. It's just... I'm not even sure what to call it, honestly. It just defies description. Though it does sound oddly familiar for some reason. Come on, Blackie! It's up to you and me to save this world. Everybody betrayed me. I fed up with this world. Oh dear God! The amazing thing is, at the end of the film, they show a short clip of the real General MacArthur's retirement speech before Congress. And that clip makes it painfully obvious just how far off Olivier was. I can understand wanting to pay tribute to a great war hero, but in this case, that may have been ill-advised. In fact, this entire portrayal of MacArthur may have been ill-advised. They made some very strange choices, like showing him and his wife sleeping not only in separate beds, but in separate rooms. Who does that? And as the movie was primarily financed by a religious organization, they put a lot of focus on MacArthur's faith in God. And it's true, MacArthur was a devout Christian, but the movie takes its interpretation of his faith a little too far, almost to the point of comedy. This comes to a head at the end of the film when General MacArthur is about to give a speech following the successful invasion of Inchon. And it's silly enough that the movie makes this look like the end of the Korean War, when in fact the war continued for another three years afterward, mostly without MacArthur since President Truman pulled him out of Korea when he threatened to bomb China. But anyway. Everyone who has gathered for MacArthur's speech is buzzing about what the general is about to say. Supposedly, it's going to be something of great importance. America's greatest soldier is about to make a statement that may change history. Well, let's listen to that history-changing moment, shall we? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The Lord's Prayer? That's it? That's his statement of great importance? This movie honestly thinks that standing up and reciting a 2,000-year-old prayer is somehow going to change history? That's the dumbest fucking thing I've ever heard. I'm pretty sure this didn't actually happen, because why the hell would it? What reason would MacArthur have to open his speech with a Christian prayer in front of a nation that's mostly secular? But like the movie told us at the beginning, it's not a documentary and they have used artistic license. And you know what? There is nothing wrong with artistic license as long as it's used correctly. But this movie doesn't seem to understand how that works. Case in point, there's a moment in the movie where a journalist covering the war tells his fellow reporters a story about General Douglas MacArthur's father, General Arthur MacArthur, and the story goes like this. Arthur MacArthur, also known as the Boy General, was attending a reunion of his Civil War unit at the Smithsonian Institute, and as he was about to give a speech, he suddenly suffered a stroke. And as he lay there dying, his fellow soldiers did not make any attempt to even call for help. Instead, they started singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic, and as Arthur died, they wrapped him in the flag of Cemetery Ridge, hoisted up his body, and carried him all the way to Arlington. 
I know this movie is not a documentary and all, but if I didn't know any better, I'd swear they were trying to get as many facts wrong as possible. First of all, Arthur MacArthur Jr. was known as the boy Colonel, not the boy General. He became a general in his 40s, which is well past what anyone would consider boyhood. It is true that he died while attending a reunion of his Civil War unit, but that reunion was in Milwaukee, not the Smithsonian Institute in D.C. He died of a heart attack, not a stroke. I honestly don't know if the rest of his unit started singing the Battle Hymn of the Republic while he was lying there dying of a heart attack, but I kinda doubt it because that would be stupid. Now, they did wrap his body in a flag, which was the flag he carried at the Battle of Missionary Ridge, not Cemetery Ridge, which is about 600 miles northeast, and he was most certainly not carried all the way to fucking Arlington. He was originally buried in Milwaukee and was moved to Arlington years later. See, the thing about artistic license is it has to be artistic. That is to say, it has to serve a purpose. You can't just spout whatever bullshit you want willy-nilly with no regard for historical fact. That's not artistic. That's lazy. That's what a child does when he has to take an essay test he didn't study for. This is pathetic. Well, in addition to this nonsense involving General MacArthur, there are quite a few subplots that are completely pointless. There's a group of journalists led by this old dude who gave that bullshit account of General Arthur MacArthur, and for reasons that are never really made clear, that old dude hates Douglas MacArthur. And by the end of the movie, for reasons that are never really made clear, he suddenly likes General MacArthur. What? At first glance, they seem like they're supposed to be comic relief characters, but there's no real comedy to speak of. And it's not because they're trying to be funny and failing, they're just... there. And I don't know why. There's also the story of this Korean couple that's about to be married. Bad timing. First, they meet up in the Seoul train station, and somehow the groom is literally the only person in the station when she arrives. How convenient. But then they're separated during the bombing of Hangang Bridge. Exactly how is not clear because, again, this movie's editing is shit. And the groom is conscripted into the North Korean army and forced to kill his fellow countrymen. But he is eventually liberated by the UN forces and kills him some commie scum. And if this story was the focus of the movie, I might have actually cared. Captured by the enemy, forced to join their army and kill your own people, eventually fighting your way out? Yeah, there's a decent story in there somewhere. Unfortunately, that's not the story we got. Instead, our main focus, apart from General MacArthur, is Major Frank Houseworth, played by Ben Gazzara. This Houseworth person did not actually exist, but the character may have been loosely based on U.S. Navy Lieutenant Eugene Clark. He is married to a woman named Barbara, played by Jacqueline Bissett, and is having an affair with a Japanese-Korean woman named Lim, played by Karen Khan. And no, I have no idea how he managed to nail himself a wife and a mistress who both appear to be about 15 years his junior. But considering who made this movie, well... Write what you know, I guess. But anyway, this is our hero, ladies and gentlemen, an adulterer. He's even living with his mistress' family, including her father, played by Toshiro Mifune and he appears to be totally cool with his daughter dating a married man. That seems... questionable. And wasn't this movie financed by a Christian organization? Doesn't Christianity normally frown on adultery? I confess I haven't been to Sunday school in many years, but I seem to recall them bringing that up once or twice. But again, considering who made this movie... Questionable morals aside, it's really hard to see Gazara as a hero when he's not even trying to hide the fact that he does not want to be here. His line delivery could not possibly sound less convincing. I have to report the soul, and I'll come back for you. Only because of the war. I liked it here. Just remember one thing. I love you. Man, that guy must have killed when reciting Shakespeare. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Gazzara's lack of effort is even more obvious when looking at the actors he has to share the screen with. Mifune is doing his best with the small part he was given, Richard Roundtree, who plays Houseworth's buddy Sergeant Henderson, is giving his all, and Bissett... well, her character is supposed to be from Philadelphia and she's not even trying to do an American accent, though perhaps she heard Olivier's attempt and thought, nah, one Englishman embarrassing himself is enough for this movie, but otherwise she is at least giving a shit. 
Gazara looks like he might fall asleep at any minute. And when listening to him talk, I feel like I might do likewise. Anyway, Major Houseworth, Barbara, and Sergeant Henderson are in Korea because... Actually, I have no idea. Major Houseworth says in one scene that he and Henderson are just supposed to be neutral observers and are not to get involved in the fighting, at least until the UN involvement becomes official, but that doesn't explain why they were in Korea in the first place. That seems like something that should have been explained. Well, regardless of why they're in Korea, now that the North has invaded, Barbara needs to get the hell out of Dodge, and her journey is quite bizarre. She ends up commandeering a taxi after the driver gets shot, and through a wacky turn of events, she picks up five little girls. Oh good, the angry adult learns how to be a happier person by taking care of children. Never seen that one before. And somehow, despite being on Hangang Bridge when it was blown to smithereens, Barbara and the girls miraculously survive. And I do mean miraculously. There is no way that car and the people inside it should not have been blown to tiny bits. I also don't understand why the hell we should give a damn about six people in a taxi when hundreds just died when that bridge was blown up. Not to mention the thousands of South Korean citizens and troops that have been killed by the North at this point. The movie never really gives us a reason to care about these people. We're supposed to care about them simply because we've been told to. It kind of reminds me of a Roland Emmerich disaster movie, where we're somehow supposed to give a damn about a small group of uninteresting people surviving while thousands are dying in the background. But then, Roland Emmerich disaster movies aren't based on actual historical events. Inchon is, and it's trivializing the shit out of those events by putting all the focus on Barbara and the schoolgirls. Which, incidentally, would make a really good name for a band. Someone needs to make that happen. Internet, go. While that nonsense is going on, Major Houseworth is supposedly trying to find his estranged wife and get her out of Korea, but is not having much luck. Sergeant Henderson, however, is able to find her with little trouble. In fact, he easily bounces back and forth between Barbara and the Major throughout the first half of the film. How is he doing this? Can Sergeant Shaft just teleport, or does he have special bilocation powers? Come to think of it, they never do make it clear just where these people are in relation to each other, so maybe he doesn't need superpowers. Maybe they've been within a mile of each other this entire time. That would be stupid, but consider what we're watching. Anyway, the Major and Barbara eventually find each other and reconcile a little too easily. Oh look, a married couple sharing a bed, how about that? And then we finally get to the Major's role in the Battle of Inchon, which is to activate the lighthouse so the ships can find their way into the harbor. And for no reason at all, the bridegroom from earlier, the Major's mistress, and her father are all involved as well. Seems unlikely the UN would approve of the enlistment of a few random civilians at the last minute, but okay. The lighthouse sequence is loosely based on a mission carried out by the real Lieutenant Clark, but because of that artistic license this movie loves so much, its interpretation of history is a bit off. They have to fight off several North Korean troops, deal with broken lighthouse equipment, and clear out some mines left in the harbor. While they did have to repair the lighthouse, they did so the day before. It was not a last-minute thing, and the North Koreans only laid a handful of mines at Incheon. Some were taken out by destroyers at low tide, and the ships safely passed over the rest at high tide. That was it. But at least this could be considered a valid example of dramatic license and not just straight up bullshit. Anyway, the mission is a success, but the mistress gets killed in the process. Oh, how convenient. Now the Major is free to go back to his wife with no consequences whatsoever for his infidelity. But we all saw that coming, didn't we? And the bridegroom is killed as well, off screen and the bride does not take the news of her fiancé's death very well. At least I assume she wouldn't. They never actually show her reacting to the news, so... It's hard to say for sure. But hey, why should we focus on the mildly interesting Korean couple when we can instead focus on the completely uninteresting American couple? Am I right? Inchon, or Inchon, is a terrible film. It's not shot well, it's not edited well, it's not acted well, it doesn't really do anything well. And considering its budget, it looks incredibly cheap. But in the end, I think its biggest problem is it's boring. 
The dialogue scenes in this movie, especially the ones involving Olivier, seem to go on forever and there is nothing interesting about them. And when we finally do get to the action, it's almost comically terrible. On more than one occasion, we'll see a soldier empty an entire clip from his submachine gun into one guy. No wonder the communists lost the war, they kept wasting ammo! The movie was nominated for five Razzies and won four. Worst Picture, Worst Screenplay, Worst Actor for Laurence Olivier, and Worst Director for Terrence Young, who tied with Ken Anakin, director of the pirate movie. And I'm not about to argue with any of those awards. Somehow, Ben Gazzara managed to avoid the title of Worst Supporting Actor, losing to Ed McMahon. But Jerry Goldsmith's score was decent, so I guess it wasn't all bad. Now, how does it compare to the previous year's Worst Picture, Mommy Dearest? If you'll recall, it was also voted the worst picture of the decade and the worst drama of the Razzies' first 25 years. Now, I did say that it would take me a while to figure out if either of those awards were justified, since I potentially have another eight years worth of material to get through. I was wrong. Inchon is worse. The end. I mean, it's not even close. I really don't know what John Wilson and company were thinking. Mommy Dearest is a bad film, but it's not Inchon bad. At least Mommy Dearest looks like a professionally made movie. At least its production quality reflects its budget. At least it isn't boring. At least it didn't use the horrors of war to promote a half-assed religious message. And I will take Faye Dunaway's overacting over Laurence Olivier's... whatever the hell that was any day. How could they look at these two films side by side and not think Inchon was worse? Give me a break. Calling Mommy Dearest the worst picture of the decade is just ridiculous, and everyone who voted for that is bad and they should feel bad. And speaking of bad, next time we'll look at the worst picture of 1983. Till then, I am the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it. I shall keep my word.